This is the second of three experiments dealing with chemical reactions and here we're looking at acid-base neutralization reactions. I'll apologize up front for the rather long intro but I need to lay some foundational groundwork relating to neutralization reactions. So there are several ways to define acids and bases. One simple but useful way defines an acid as a substance that hydrolyzes and that means reacts with water to produce hydronium ion H3O plus. For example, hydrogen chloride is a gas which when dissolved in water produces hydronium ion and chloride ion. Now although free hydrogen ions, just H plus, do not exist in aqueous solution, they're always chemically combined with water to make hydronium ion, it's still acceptable and often easier to write chemical equations as if free hydrogen ion existed like this, HCl in H2O produces hydrogen ion and chloride ion. Now similarly, a base is a substance that hydrolyzes to release hydroxide ion. For example, sodium hydroxide in water releases sodium ion and hydroxide ion. Many acids contain ionizable hydrogen in their chemical formulas. For example, the hydrogen in HCl is ionizable but metal salts like aluminum sulfate and ferric nitrate, titanium 4 chloride, despite having no ionizable hydrogens in their formula, will hydrolyze producing hydronium ion. It is the polyvalent, that is highly charged, metal cation that does the hydrolysis. For example, aluminum ion in water releases a hydrogen ion. It does so by binding or tying up the hydroxide ion out of water producing AlOH plus 2. Notice in this equation that charges are balanced plus 3 and 0 is equal to 1 and 2. Now monovalent metal cations like lithium, sodium, potassium they're really not acidic at all. They need to be polyvalent to have this effect. Acids containing ionizable hydrogens are called protic acids, whereas acids without ionizable hydrogens are called aprotic acids. So HCl is a protic acid, aluminum chloride is an aprotic acid. Metal hydroxides are often basic, for example sodium hydroxide, calcium hydroxide, aluminum hydroxide they contain ionizable hydroxide ions but some non-metal anions are also basic for example carbonate and sodium carbonate and phosphate and sodium phosphate they're basic because they hydrolyze releasing hydroxide anion so for example carbonate in water releases hydroxide ion and does so by tying up or binding a hydrogen ion from water producing bicarbonate now bicarbonate is a weak base and it'll react with water to a small extent to produce another hydroxide ion again by binding one of the hydrogen ions from the water producing carbonic acid. Look at phosphate in water. It produces hydroxide ion. It does so by binding a hydrogen ion from the water producing monohydrogen phosphate. Now monohydrogen phosphate is moderately strong as a base and it'll react a second time now with water producing another hydroxide anion binding another hydrogen ion producing dihydrogen phosphate. Let's take a look at some common acids and bases. Acetic acid. A 5% solution of this acid is known as vinegar. Sulfuric acid is battery acid in your car, specifically at 36% when the battery is fully charged. Phosphoric acid is something you can buy at the local auto shop. It's a rust remover for cleaning rust from your car. Also in small quantities is added as a root beer flavor in pop. Nitric acid is a fairly corrosive acid. It's the main ingredient of acid rain. It forms from auto exhaust, typically nitrogen oxygen compounds of varying ratios called NOx that form in the internal combustion engine in small quantities. Hydrochloric acid, you can purchase it as a 
solution called muriatic acid at the hardware store. It's used to clean mortar from brickwork. And finally, carbonic acid. Well, it's the familiar acid in carbonated beverages. Some bases include sodium hydroxide. That's the active ingredient in Drano, which degreases. Bases dissolve grease. Magnesium hydroxide is a weaker base. It's commonly sold as milk of magnesia used for neutralizing acid indigestion. Calcium hydroxide, commonly called lime, is a binding agent in cement. And ammonia, NH3, is a base. So these hydrogens are in no way acidic, which is typically why they're not written on the left. We don't want to confuse them as being acidic. They're not acidic at all. And the nitrogen itself is somewhat basic. A 5% solution of ammonia is known as Windex, and it's a degreaser. It's a base. It's a cleaner. Sodium carbonate, another base, a detergent builder used in many detergent formulations. And sodium bicarbonate, a weaker base known as baking soda. Now it's well known that acids react with bases in a reaction called neutralization. And for protic acids reacting with metal hydroxide bases, the general formula for neutralization is shown here. Here's the generic form, HX plus BOH produces HOH, water, and a salt. Probably easier to see if we take a specific example. Here's hydrogen chloride or HCl plus sodium hydroxide. So the hydrogen ion and the hydroxide ion combine to make water. The cation from the base, in this case sodium ion, and the anion from the acid, in this case chloride ion, combine to produce a salt. Now, balancing this type of equation is quite easy. Just remember that hydrogen ion and hydroxide ion are combining in equal ratios. So if you had to balance the equation of hydrogen chloride reacting with aluminum hydroxide, you can see in the formula of aluminum hydroxide it has three hydroxides. So you know that you'll need three moles of hydrogen chloride to produce three moles of water and aluminum chloride as the salt. Now, you're probably quite familiar with pH, but let me mention it briefly. The pH of an aqueous solution is a number based on a scale from 0 to 14, and it's commonly used to describe the acidity or basicity of a solution. And a pH below 7 is acidic. All these things down here on the left. The pH above 7 is basic to the right on this diagram. And then another word for basic is alkaline. And a pH of exactly 7 is neutral. You can determine the pH of a solution using special dyes called indicators. You can use pH strips or electronic devices such as pH meters. In this experiment, we'll be using a, a dye, an indicator dye. Here's a domestic application of a neutralization reaction. Vinegar contains 5% acetic acid, and it's often used to dissolve scale, typically, mostly, calcium carbonate deposits in a kettle. And calcium carbonate, like other metal carbonates, is a base and will be neutralized by an acid. When metal carbonates are neutralized, the product of neutralization is a salt and water and carbon dioxide. So here's the balanced equation for acetic acid and calcium carbonate. Now looking at acetic acid, you can appreciate that it only has one acidic hydrogen. The only ionizable hydrogen is the one bonded to the oxygen. The three hydrogens bonded to carbon are completely nonpolar bonds, and those are not acidic hydrogens in any way, shape, or form. So acetic acid is monoprotic. Calcium carbonate, on the other hand, is dibasic. So you'd need two moles of acetic acid to react with one mole of calcium carbonate, producing carbon dioxide and water and a salt, in this case, calcium acetate. And if you look at this carefully, CO2 is produced from the carbonate. That leaves one oxygen remaining. Each oxygen combines with two hydrogens, which came from the acid to produce H2O. In terms of the procedure, let me give you an overview. In neutralization reactions, strong to moderately strong acids and bases react stoichiometrically. A weak acid and a weak base will not react completely or stoichiometrically, but if they're moderately strong to strong, either or both, you can bring the reaction to completion. In this experiment, you'll react a strong acid, 
HCl with known masses of moderately strong bases, sodium carbonate, and a somewhat weaker base, sodium bicarbonate, then you'll be asked to calculate the exact molar concentration of the HCl solution. Now later in this program you'll be using volumetric glassware to perform this work more accurately, but for this experiment we will measure volumes with only modest accuracy using a graduated cylinder. Now I'll give you details of the procedure as I demonstrate it, but let me just explain to you the reaction equations here. In part A, you'll be neutralizing a monobasic base sodium bicarbonate with HCl. And here's the reaction equation. Sodium bicarbonate, one mole, reacts with one mole of HCl, producing sodium chloride, water, and carbon dioxide. In part B of this reaction, you'll be neutralizing a dibasic base, sodium carbonate. And let's look at the reactions. Sodium carbonate will react with one mole of HCl, releasing salt and giving us sodium bicarbonate. Now, sodium bicarbonate is still basic, can react a second time using a second mole of HCl, this time now producing sodium chloride, water, and carbon dioxide. So the overall reaction is that sodium carbonate reacts with two moles of HCl, producing two moles of sodium chloride and water and CO2. Now how will you know when to stop adding acid? How will you know when you've just neutralized all of the base? We do it with an indicator. We're going to use methyl orange indicator. And this indicator is yellow at a pH greater than 4.4. Then it turns orange between 4.4 and 3.1, and below 3.1 it's red. So you'll want to stop adding acid when the indicator just turns orange. If you go a drop more, that's okay. That'll be the first red color. You just can't keep adding more because it stays at red and you wouldn't know how much you've added. I'll demonstrate this in the experiment. Let's take a look at the reaction, and then we'll come back and talk about the calculations for this. Here's the equipment that we'll need for this experiment. Obviously we'll need a top loading balance. In the beakers we have these white powders, that's pure sodium bicarbonate and pure sodium carbonate. We'll weigh these into our 150 mil beakers. We'll need a stir bar, a mag stirrer on the right. Here's our methyl orange indicator up front. We have this approximately 3 molar HCl in a bottle. We have a 25 mil graduated cylinder in the back and a wash bottle and that's about all we need. All right, so we want to start by tearing a clean 150 mil beaker. And for sodium bicarbonate, we want to add approximately 3.3 grams. Whatever mass you add, make sure you record the exact mass. Whenever you're transferring solids, as I'm doing here, make sure that both beakers are as close as possible to each other, so you should not spilling on the balance. If you do get any spilling, it falls into one of the two beakers. I'm reaching around the camera to do this, so it's pretty awkward, otherwise I'd have them closer still. I'll speed this up a bit, and looks like 3.30, uh, it's a good number. Next we want to rinse down the sides of the beaker with a stream or jet of distilled water to make sure that all the solids in fact get into solution. And then dilute to about 60 mils and I'll speed this up as well. You want to add a mag stir bar and stir to dissolve the sodium bicarbonate. gets bogged down on the solids occasionally. I'm going to add one drop of methyl orange indicator. Just one drop gives you the best color change. It's easier to see the color change from yellow to orange. Next you want to add exactly 25 mils of the approximately 3 molar hydrochloric acid solution to the graduated cylinder. You can use a pasture pipette to add a little extra or take a little out to get it exactly the 25 mil mark, but I just got lucky here and got it pretty much right on in this case. 
use a pasture pipette to begin adding hydrochloric acid. Now I've worked out approximately the volume that will be required so I know about where it is uh, but if you're not sure start slowly and you'll see the appearance of the red color momentarily and when that dissipates then you add more. As you approach the end point the red color persists for longer and longer periods of time. Notice the effervescence as CO2 is being released and that's required for the reaction to go to completion. That makes your bar still having a hard time getting bogged down. Maybe that plate's getting old. Again, when you make your transfers, try and keep your two um, containers as close as possible so there's no spilling on the bench. Any spill should fall into one of the two containers. So you want to stir this as rapidly as possible to expel the CO2. You need that for the reaction to go to completion, but you don't want to stir so fast that you're going to spit or splatter liquid out of the beaker. When the red color persists for longer and longer, you know you're getting close, and that's when you want to slow down and add dropwise. Again, I'm going quickly because I pre-calculated, but if this was my first time doing it, I would go a little slower. Okay, I'm getting close here. Notice how the red persists, really close. So be careful. All right, when you think you're there, good time to rinse down the sides of the beaker with the stream of distilled water, make sure that all the reagents are mixed. And I do have a bit of an orange color. I'm going to add just one drop, see how that looks. When you think you've reached the end point, take a reading of the volume in the graduated cylinder, and then you can always add another drop and read it again if necessary. Look, one drop, and that's pretty much it. That's the red you're looking for. This looks like 12.8 mils, as near as I can tell. So you want to do this titration in triplicate for sodium bicarbonate and then in triplicate for sodium carbonate. Let's go back to the procedure and talk about the calculations and the lab report. Let's take a look at the lab report requirements for this experiment. Write a formal lab report and include the following. Number one, calculate the molarity of the HCl using the sodium carbonate data and the sodium bicarbonate data, but I'm going to show you first how to do it with sodium carbonate. Please follow the same calculation procedure. Take the mass of sodium carbonate that you weigh out, grams, divided by the molar mass of sodium carbonate, 106 grams per mole, and you get the number of moles of sodium carbonate. Notice the units, grams divided by grams per mole is moles. Then from there, calculate the number of moles of HCl that will be neutralized by this many moles of sodium carbonate. You do it this way, you know that two moles of HCl are neutralized for every one mole of sodium carbonate, so multiply then the moles of sodium carbonate by two to get the moles of HCl. It will be double that amount, 0415 moles of HCl. We want to calculate the molarity, which is moles per liter, so divide the number of moles of HCl by the volume of the HCl that you added to reach the neutralization point, but do it in liters, not milliliters. So 13.2 milliliters would have been the amount added. That's 0 0.0132 liters. Moles divided by liters is moles per liter, and that's molarity, 3.14 moles per liter in this case. Then calculate the molarity of the HCl using the sodium bicarbonate data as well. But because sodium bicarbonate is monobasic, then the number of moles of HCl added will be the same as the number of moles of sodium bicarbonate, not double. The same calculation, but in this step you'd simply have one mole of HCl per one mole of sodium bicarbonate. So the number of moles of sodium bicarbonate will be the same as the number of moles of HCl. For each set of neutralizations, calculate the average molarity and the standard deviation 
of your values and the relative standard deviation. Then finally calculate the percent difference between the two concentration values, the two average concentration values, the one you determine with sodium carbonate compared to the one you determine with sodium bicarbonate. Please present your data in the table just as I'm shown here. So in this example, here's the sodium carbonate. Assuming one had weighed out 2.20 grams of sodium carbonate three times, dividing by the molar mass tells me this is the number of moles of sodium carbonate I had present each time. And this would then be the number of moles of HCl that would be neutralized by those moles of sodium carbonate, twice as much. Divide by the volume in liters, so here's the volume added in milliliters divided by a thousand, that's liters. Then moles divided by liters is moles per liter, and these are th my three molarities. Take the average, 3.18. Determine the sample standard deviation of these three values, and then the percent RSD. And again, just see the appendix to know how to calculate these. It's quite straightforward. Now, you say, how do I know how many decimals to report in my average? That's what you're going to be marked on. It's really, really easy. Look at the standard deviation. The first significant figure in the standard deviation occurs in the second decimal place. And so you must report your result to the second decimal place. No more and no less. That simple. All right, number five, new concept here. Since one mole of sodium carbonate neutralizes two moles of hydrogen ion, what's the equivalent weight of sodium carbonate? What I'm asking you is, what weight of sodium carbonate would neutralize just one mole of hydrogen ion? Well, we know that 106 grams is a mole of sodium carbonate and that neutralizes two moles of HCl. How much for one mole? We'll divide by two. So 53 grams per equivalent is the equivalent weight of sodium carbonate. Calculate the molar mass and equivalent weight of the following bases. Sodium hydroxide, monobasic, magnesium hydroxide, dibasic, aluminum hydroxide, tribasic and you can complete that right in this section of the table. On the next page, you are asked to complete and balance the following acid-base neutralization equations using chemical formulas, not words. Assume complete neutralization occurs in all cases. And I've given you here a table that you can copy and paste into your lab report directly and please use this table to do your calculations. Here is the molar mass of sodium bicarbonate and here is the molar mass of sodium carbonate. And that should do it, so thanks for watching.